for me, it looks like four o'clock by my watch. Yep, that's what mine says too, so. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. Well, hello and welcome everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the CAP Guest Lecture Series this year, Mr. Tony Elliott, or to his readers, Mr. Tony. <laughs> Tony Elliott is an architect, interior designer, registration number two in the state, and an instructor in our interior design program. He joined our faculty team just this semester. Projects he has worked on include the JW Marriott and Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, a casino, hotel, and airport terminal in Las Vegas, the United States Air Force Academy Cadet Chapel renovation in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and the Transportation Center at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Overseas, he has worked in the United Arab Emirates, Libya, the Bahamas, and more. He completed residential evaluations for the hurricane relief effort for the US Virgin Islands of St. Thomas and St. John, and is the developer of the iPhone app Wallet, a paint and wall covering calculator. Elliot is also the author of Sketchbook Benghazi, Day of Rage Through an Architect's Eyes, a reflection on working in Libya during the violent protests in 2011, the time of the Arab Spring. As Mr. Elliot presents, please feel free to pose your questions and comments by typing them in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And after the presentation, he will try to answer as many of these as possible. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Tony. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, it's my honor to, uh, to be invited to speak with you today. I wanna to thank the uh, CAP Lecture Series coordinators and Dr. Jones for allowing me to, to share with you um, oops, let me get my next slide up here for some reason. Uh, I'm going to share with you, um, let's see, I've got a little issue here with the, yeah, uh, the unusual path that I've uh, taken. So I'm talking about my uh, design career over these past 50 years. So what I'd like to do is um, um, we'll get some of the, um, we probably don't need to get some of the housekeeping out of the way, but uh, if you hope to, uh, to gain any uh, AIA credits for this uh, session, I'm, I'm afraid you're, you're out of luck. So uh, we'll just, uh, we won't worry about uh, that sort of thing. Uh, at this time. So the, um, some of you might recognize this building, uh, some of you might not, but uh, this was actually the architecture building uh, at Ball State back in the early 70s. And um, I was ex actually accepted at uh, Ball State to study architecture. But at that time, the, uh, the program wasn't uh, accredited. So uh, later in the 70s, they got a, uh, a new building and um, got accredited and everything, but uh, um, the, uh, the University of Cincinnati uh, also accepted me. So I thought uh, uh, I'll just take, uh, take a chance with the uh, accreditation and uh, went down to Cincinnati instead. So they had a co-op program down there. And um, even though the bachelor's program is, is six years, my, my um, co-op experience actually counted towards my state of Indiana work requirements. So I only had to wait one year after I graduated uh, before I could take the registration exam. And um, so this was the, uh, the newer building. This was brand new building at, at Cincinnati when I graduated, so. Um, but um, my, uh, my high school sweetheart, uh, now my wife of 47 years was studying at, uh, at Ball State and so I would hitchhike most weekends from Cincinnati to, uh, to Muncie and um, got to meet quite a few interesting people along the way. And so I got to really know I-74 and, and State Road 3 uh, pretty well. I got my registration in Indiana in 1979 and my Nevada license in um, 2014. Uh, and as uh, uh, Dr. Jones mentioned, I, uh, I'm the first registered architect in the state of Indiana to, uh, to become a registered interior designer. So my registration number, uh, uh, registered interior design number is uh, two. Um, 
one of the electives that I took at UC um, was actually in the industrial design department. And uh, I took a class in coding in this uh, computer program called Fortran 4. And um, the, uh, back in those days, you'd have to type your uh, program out onto an IBM card. And uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the IBM card, each card represented one line of code uh, to write the program. And so I had this entire box of uh, uh, codes uh, or, you know, I type it into the, the uh, IBM key punch card machine to take my box of cards and then go over to a, uh, a card reader, uh, shove it in there. And um, if you, uh, you wait three days to, uh, to get back your, your drawing. And um, I discovered that uh, I kind of messed up my uh, program a little bit. So I forgot to tell the, uh, the pen when to lift the pen up. So I had to figure out which cards were, were wrong and then wait three more days to get uh, an eight and a half by 11 um, pr uh, plot out of the, uh, <clears throat> of the system. So my first, uh, first job was actually with a fairly, pretty large uh, architectural firm in Indianapolis, and uh, we our drafting room actually did look sort of similar to this uh, back in the early 70s. So it, it brings back old memories when I see this, this sort of thing. Um, and then since I was the new kid on the block, I got to spend countless hours making blueprints and sepia prints on the, uh, the ammonia machine that you see in the center of the screen. And um, uh, you would, you know, basically put in one drawing at a time and uh, pull it out. And, and to this day, my, I think my sinuses are still messed up from the amount of ammonia that I uh, inhaled during those years. So, but then in the 80s, um, I got exposed to my, the first CAD system uh, was on display at the AIA convention uh, in 1980. And I thought to myself, this is the future for architecture. So I, I wanted to go down that path to figure out more about uh, computers and CAD and see where it would lead me. And so, to, you know, now that you've got, we go from, in 1980, we go from a, a one workstation that, that takes up an entire computer room with raised flooring and special air conditioning and all that sort of thing. And then it migrated to uh, the uh, desktop and now everything's pretty much can be run on a on a two pound laptop. So uh, the the uh, the whole path of going down the CAD CAD route uh, was something of great interest to me. So um, <clears throat> with the ups and downs of the economy, the architecture is kind of a uh, feast and famine kind of uh, uh, business. So um, the, uh, I, I worked for quite a few firms uh, over the years, past 50 years, and uh, these are just some of the, the firms that I was, um, had, was fortunate to work for. Uh, everything from you know, AECOM being the, the largest firm, AE firm in the world, and down to uh, the Elliott Group there in the center, which is a, uh, a group of one. So uh, it, uh, it, it's been a, uh, an interesting uh, road. And then since 1980, I've, uh, I've learned about uh, 10 different CAD systems over the years. So um, CAD is, it's kind of special to me, but uh, hand drawing is also uh, is something that I enjoy. So I, I've got quite a bit of experience when it comes to the, uh, the various CAD, CAD modules that are out there. Um, the, uh, the main idea about my, my talk today is uh, I kind of broke my presentation up into three groups, people, places, and things. And I had the opportunity to attend a number of keynote addresses over the years. And some of these addresses were actually um, where I got to meet uh, some world-renowned designers in the profession. I also have been blessed with working on and seeing firsthand some of the most iconic structures, uh, buildings in the world. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about some other 
design avenues that uh, some of you might consider for your future path. So I thought I'd uh, start out with uh, some of the people that I've met over the years. First person that kind of uh, made an impression on me was uh, actually a, a lecture at Ball State uh, in Emmons Auditorium in 1972. Um, Buckminster Fuller was uh, was at Ball State, and um, <clears throat> his lecture actually took four hours. And and I promise you, my my lecture today hopefully won't uh, drag out to be four hours long. But anyway, the um, uh, the thing that I took away from his keynote address that kind of stuck with me back in '72, you know, so I was just a sophomore uh, at uh, Cincinnati. And one thing he said was that uh, specialization can lead to extinction. And so I thought from that point on that I would uh, try to try to uh, fit as many different areas of design um, into um, uh, my career and, uh, and see what happens. So for those of you that might not know uh, or recognize Mr. Fuller, he, uh, he invented the geodesic dome and then I, uh, I got to meet uh, I.M. Pei. Uh, he was uh, in the early 80s. Mr. Pei was a keynote speaker at an AIA convention that I was attending. And I wrote a paper about Mr. Pei uh, when I attended UC. And it was a thrill to get to uh, actually get a photo of him with me and some of my coworkers. So that was, that was kind of cool. And um, <clears throat> um, I visited quite a few of uh, Mr. Pei's designs over the around the world, and uh, you know the, the National Gallery of Art in Washington D.C. was just there uh, a year or so ago, and then um, I even uh, saw some of his work over in the Middle East. So, and then Michael Graves, uh, um, I've attended two of his uh, keynote addresses over the years, and uh, as you can see, he's also. Uh, not only born in Indianapolis, but also a, a UC grad. And uh, a couple of his projects that you're probably familiar with, the NCAA headquarters and the Humana building in, in Louisville. So, and then uh, Santiago Calatrava was a, a keynote speaker that I, I saw. Um, and he would, he would actually, he was actually sketching uh, a live drawing uh, as part of his keynote and just the way he, his mind thinks and the way he sketches, it was just uh, really intriguing. And um, so I uh, went up to Milwaukee not too long ago and saw his uh, art museum. And uh, it's, it's really cool to s just stand back and if you, if you catch it at the right time, and I just happened to be there when, the, when these wings close up at night, it takes about 20 minutes for the wings to close up, but uh, it, it's an amazing structure if you get a chance to see that. And then um, when I was in Abu Dhabi, these three guys just happened to be in town uh, to talk about their projects that they're doing in, uh, in the Middle East. And um, <clears throat> so Sir Norman Foster um, was there to talk about his project and then uh, Jean Nouvel, and then, uh, as you, a lot of you know, uh, Frank Gehry. And so what Abu Dhabi has done is they've created a, um, there's an area of town, it's kind of just to the north of the downtown uh, Abu Dhabi uh, area, but it's called uh, Sadia Island. And um, it's got a number of residential areas and hotels and shopping and They've also created what they call their, their cultural district. And so um, Mr. Foster or Sir, Sir Norman Foster is, is doing uh, the uh, Sheikh Zayed uh, Museum. And um, this is what it's gonna kind of look like. It, it hasn't started construction yet. And um, then uh, Frank Geary is working, they, they're supposed to be, I think they were supposed to break ground for a new uh, Guggenheim uh, just off the little uh, uh, Bay area there. It's, you know, quite similar to the uh, Guggenheim in, uh, in Spain. 
So, and then uh, uh, Jean Nouvel is, uh, he just completed, they just completed the <clears throat> Lou, a new Louvre uh, branch office, if you want to call it that, uh, in Abu Dhabi. And it opened up in uh, 2017. Um, it's uh, got this very intricate lacy roof structure that's kind of suspended up and over the, uh, the gallery spaces. And um, it, because of the, um, the pearl divers the, back in the day, they, uh, he wanted the, the whole relationship of water to be part of the uh, experience with the uh, uh, museum goers. And then the way the light comes through the roof, um, it just kind of uh, adds a whole new dimension to the, uh, the museum experience. <clears throat> then I met this guy, um, Bill Baker, you know, his name doesn't really pop up very often, but uh, Mr. Baker was a structural engineer for SOM. And uh, he actually gave a lecture about his creation, the uh, Burj Khalifa um, tower um, in downtown Dubai. And so uh, it's, it's an amazing structure. Um, you, you can see it from, you know, well, from my villa where I was living, uh, you could see it uh, clear as day. And when the sun would hit it, uh, early morning sun, it would, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, light up the top, almost like a fireball at the way the glass uh, uh, would light up. And then at night, it's even uh, a pretty impressive structure. And so when, when Mr. Baker was talking about <clears throat> the way he designed it, um, because of the way the winds come in from the desert, he, he purposely uh, made the, the wings of the building look like, you know, almost like an airplane wing. So there was not any uh, case where the, the wind would hit it directly perpendicular. So it was all kind of a smooth uh, wing-like structure. <clears throat> And then what was kind of interesting about the foundations, <clears throat> excuse me, not only for um, the Burj Khalifa, but most of the buildings in the Middle East, or at least in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, um, have they use, since the foundations, the, the amount of sand that you're building on is rather difficult to find something uh, substantial to for your soil borings and everything. So a lot of the buildings are built on pilings and these pilings in, in this case for the Burj Khalifa there are 192 of these pilings under the building and I don't know if you can see my mouse or not but uh, um, so you've got all the pilings <clears throat> and then you've got this what they would call a concrete raft and this raft is really ends up being about uh, almost 12 feet thick um, for the building to actually set on and so the, the, the pilings are each, uh, you know, four feet diameter, roughly on, in this case it was, but um, then you've got this huge uh, slab with, you know, rebar and everything in it uh, sitting. So everything just sitting on top of that. So it's, it's, it's an, a major structural effort to, uh, to make something like that work, especially in the Middle East. And, um, then I, I bumped into this guy at a lecture, um, Alan Robert, uh, a lot of you might not have, have heard of him before, but he's the crazy guy that goes around the world and climbs uh, high rise buildings. And uh, so he happened to be in Dubai. And I, so I got a selfie with him. But um, his, his uh, you know, he's climbed the uh, Sears Tower and the John Hancock Tower. And, you know, he was Usually he climbs them without any harness or anything, but uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed from Dubai said, no, nah, if you want to climb the uh, Burj Khalifa, you're going to have to do it at least with a harness. There, there was no nets or anything, but he, you know, he insurance or liability wise, he wanted to keep the Sheikh happy. So um, he, uh, he climbed that uh, um, 
and that was kind of cool. So <clears throat> now I'm going to kind of uh, shift over into uh, various places that I've been over the years, over 50 years. So um, we'll start out with talking about some of the projects that I worked on. One of the first projects uh, when I first got out of school was uh, the Belmont sewage treatment plant in uh, Indianapolis. So um, not too exciting, but uh, and definitely uh, you don't want to leave your car window open during a hot summer day because uh, it, it just won't be the same after you uh, try to go back home. But um, uh, the Belmont sewage treatment plant was, uh, was one project it was kind of interesting. And then uh, of all things, a, a few years later, I get to called up to do another sewage treatment plant. So I was hoping that maybe my design career wouldn't be just stuck out on uh, sewage treatment plants. But uh, so I, I did get to do a few other things besides that. But what was kind of interesting about the uh, Boston Harbor project was when you if I don't know if you've been to Boston or not, but when you fly into Logan Airport, uh, you actually fly over Deer Island and um, so one of the things that I had to do for that project was actually build a 3D uh, CAD model of the facility. And um, so these digesters that you see there, these, these egg shaped things, what's kind of cool about this project was the sewage, if you know, other stuff that's in there, but uh, um, the methane that actually is generated off of the sludge uh, the methane gas would actually roll up on the edge of inside these tanks. And then these extractors that you see at the top of the, um, of the egg would, would uh, take the methane gas off of the, out of the egg. And they actually use the methane to power the entire plant. So it's kind of a interesting sustainability, uh, uh, a way to, to, uh, uh, keep their, uh, zero footprint uh, as po much as possible. So, um, and then <clears throat> one of the first projects that I actually stamped with my own stamp was a, um, a little, uh, little town uh, gas station uh, for a friend of mine. And um, so if you ever go to VV, Indiana, uh, it's right on the Ohio River between Madison and Cincinnati, uh, this little gas station still standing um, so, uh, just, just say hi to Larry for me when you, uh, when you go there, but, uh, that, that was my beginning of my Indiana projects. Um, and then, uh, did an office building. I tried not to overshadow the, uh, college park pyramids with my, uh, with my office building. It was a little 12,000 square foot office building for the national national association of mutual insurance companies. And they later sold the building to uh, um, a, a educational fraternity called Kappa Delta Pi. So um, one little trick to when you're when you're photographing your projects, um, try to get everybody to move their car out of the way. So the, the pictures look a lot uh, nicer if you keep the cars out. So one guy left his in there, but uh, actually that's my car. So never mind. Um, so that was, uh, the one project they did on the, on the north side, northwest side of Indianapolis. Then another one actually in the same general area of, uh, of College Park is, uh, Assemblies of God, um, Indiana headquarters. And so it, uh, this one was in brick. The other one, I actually did that in, um, uh, the National Insurance Company wanted to, use Indiana limestone. So we, uh, it was the first time I'd ever detailed a, a project with limestone. And it was kind of fun to, uh, to do that. And then <clears throat> it's always great when you have a family member that calls you up and says, hey, uh, can you design me a new house? And uh, so about 20 years ago, my sister called me. And, um, and so I put together some ideas for her for a new house in Chicago. So she's got, uh, she's got four boys and they needed a larger house. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the back wing of the house uh, is, is the kitchen itself. That, that whole thing's about a 20 by 20 uh, space. And um, 
so she, she, my sister loves to cook and so does her husband. So they wanted to have the kitchen uh, so that they could look through the bay, uh, bay window out to their pool uh, in the ground pool area. So that was fun. And uh, <clears throat> then a good friend of mine uh, just recently helped my sister with a whole new look to the interiors of the house. So this is their, uh, their main family room. And, um, and then the garage, or actually the, the area above the three car garage um, <clears throat> is my uh, sister's uh, master bedroom area. So it was large enough that they could have a, a seating area um, and relax after a hard day at work. So, <clears throat> and as, as Dr. Jones mentioned, I, I got the opportunity to work on the Lucas Oil Stadium. And um, that was a fun project to work on. And I got, got a chance to prepare quite a few uh, construction drawings in the, uh, the, the portion of that project. HKS designed it out of Dallas, but uh, uh, I was working for A2SO4 at the time. And uh, we did all of the public uh, concession stand areas. So it was a, a matter of um, uh, detailing various things uh, on that project, especially uh, some of the, the details for <clears throat> the stainless steel uh, look and feel that they wanted for uh, dining areas. And then the uh, concession areas themselves too. And then uh, Browning Day was involved with the uh, design of the uh, Colt store but I, I was in charge of uh, working out some of the details on how to get the stair to work uh, in, in the space. And then I uh, got a chance to work on the uh, Indianapolis Airport project. And um, again, A2SO4 was involved on that project and we were involved with the other firms. There was kind of a con uh, coalition of firms, but the parking garage was uh, one aspect of the project that I got a chance to work on. And then, um, then the JW Marriott, um, when it was built in Indianapolis, it was the largest JW in the, in the USA. Uh, I think they've got some other ones bigger now, but it was 34 stories and just a little over a, a thousand rooms. And um, the, the, the box, uh, the brick box uh, is basically the, uh, convention space meeting rooms for the JW. And um, the uh, Indianapolis skyline looking east is it's pretty impressive having the, uh, the JW there as a, a backdrop. And then the interiors, there was an interior design firm that uh, we worked with uh, out of Chicago that did all the interiors for the JW. And so my job was to take their um, you know, uh, schematic designs, design development drawings and figure out the detailing for a lot of their finishes that they wanted to do in the space. And um, so a quick question for you is, uh, you know, how many square feet are there in, uh, in an acre? So I, we, we won't have a pop quiz or anything. I'll just try to, I'll, I'll tell you the answer. So uh, don't worry about it too much. And um, so it's 43,560 square feet. And what's kind of interesting about that number is uh, the, the grand ballroom that I worked on for the JW has 40,000 square feet in it. So it's almost an acre of free, no columns in the space, um, which was kind of a major effort. Uh, I was working with a structural engineer out of uh, Seattle on this project. And it was tricky trying to figure out how to get that much uh, free space open to meet the requirement because in order for Indianapolis to uh, qualify for a Super Bowl site, um, they had to, you had to provide a one, one space somewhere in the city that was 40,000 square feet or bigger. And so uh, when they built the JW, it was mainly built because of the Super Bowl. And uh, so we were able to accommodate that requirement by uh, we put the grand ballroom actually up on the third floor of the JW 
And then it's just a free span with these huge trusses that go uh, clear across the, uh, the building. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to, uh, there's, there's, there's many hats that uh, architects and designers uh, wear throughout their career. So kind of gonna go through some of the hats that I've uh, gotten to uh, wear over the years. So as a design manager or an owner's rep, um, it, it kind of leads you into some interesting projects. Um, so back in 2009, a lot of architects got laid off and um, uh, I think it was, it was uh, you know, well, everybody had a hard time in 2008, 2009. But um, when I got laid off in 2009, um, I wasn't sure where my design path was gonna take me. So, but I got a call from a friend of mine in Dubai and he said he needed some help with a, a new five-star hotel right on the Mediterranean. And little did I know at the, at the moment that he was talking to me that it was gonna be in Libya of all places. I said, isn't that where uh, Gaddafi lives? And he said, oh yeah, but he's, he's kind of mellowed out. And so, you know, don't worry about it. Well, the project was, uh, it was gonna be a five-star hotel, uh, 400 rooms, seven stories. And when I arrived in Benghazi, the hotel had been under construction for two years and it was already six months behind schedule. So uh, I got involved as a, kind of a project manager on site. Um, this is a, a, a Google Earth picture of the, uh, the hotel. It's kind of a, kind of a U-shaped piece uh, architecture plan. And then our, our uh, job trailers were over here on the uh, to the left of that a little bit, but the, we had a view of the Mediterranean. So every day you go to work and, you know, you see the ocean and feel the breeze and, you know, it was, it was, it was nice for a while. So, um, and then, um, but the, uh, you know, they, they liked, they, they had some pretty nice uh, um, construction trailers for us. So it was, was not a big deal. You know, it wasn't just a tin roof kind of thing, but uh, it, it was okay. And um, then we, uh, Colonel Gaddafi, not sure why he called himself Colonel, he should have gone to general, but um, anyway, Colonel Gaddafi, uh, he liked to hang his photos on just about any project uh, in, in the country. So we had to have a big uh, poster of his um, uh, likeness up on our building um, most of the time. And um, just a different view of the, uh, the hotel from the street side, looking back from the uh, from the ocean, and it was all uh, Egyptian white marble. It was uh, it was gorgeous the way they detailed it. Um, it was a little tricky though because uh, the um, the architect was actually from Tunisia, and um, he'd never really done an, a, a hotel before, especially a five star hotel, and so. Uh, what it, one of the things I discovered is that he had all 400 rooms were king size bedrooms. There, there was no, they didn't plan for any uh, double queens and they didn't have any rooms that were, uh, you know, with the, the passageway adjacent uh, way to get from one room to the other. So they were all single king beds and uh, it just didn't, uh, work out too well when, especially when Intercontinental Hotel decided to take over the management of the hotel, they gave me uh, two three ring binders with all of their design specifications, which the architect from Tunisia hadn't used. So we had a little problem with that. And, um, but the look and feel of the, uh, the hotel, it was gonna be gorgeous um, if it ever got finished. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting was um, you can kind of see that the the bollards in the uh, the handrail uh, they're they're like three feet apart and um, so didn't quite meet uh, again not only um, safety issues that the U.S. is used to but uh, um, I asked the architect I said you know um, code wise Intercontinental is going to be a little upset. Uh, because the, the spacing's too much. You know, I said, my grandson could probably, you know, walk through there and fall off the balcony 
uh, and get hurt. And so the answer that I got from the architect from Tunisia was, uh, well, don't let your grandson go up the stairs. So I thought, well, okay, so we're, we're gonna have a problem here. Um, but, um, but yeah, some of the detailing that they did uh, was really was really terrific. Um, and so it was kind of a fun thing to see uh, how other architects design things and, or don't design them correctly. But uh, anyway, um, these next few slides kind of show some issues that we had with uh, what, what you would call safety. Um, there, there is no such thing as OSHA in, uh, in Libya. So people did not wear any safety harnesses. Um, the, the, the platforms for the scaffolding were just two by fours. Um, it, was, uh, it was amazing. I, I was just scared to death that somebody was gonna fall uh, while I was there. And um, um, then we had an issue, I, I mentioned ADA. Oops, um, go back. Um, okay, so um, I don't know if you can see my, oops, okay, something's going on here. Okay, the, the ramp or the stairs that you see going towards the uh, outdoor swimming pool, there's a concrete ramp uh, kind of covered up with a little dust and dirt there, but uh, that's the ramp that they put in to get wheelchairs down to the uh, to the swimming pool, and I said, uh, "Well, yeah, you guys, you don't, you're not using the correct formula for figuring out ramps." I said, "If somebody goes down that ramp, they're going to be in the pool before they can stop. So we're going to have to rip that out and uh, start over." And they 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 couldn't quite understand what's the big deal about. Uh, uh, ADA issues. And I said, well, chapter 12 of uh, intercontinental hotel requirements require it. So we were going to have to do it or uh, start over again. And then we had a situation where the architect uh, Tunisian guy uh, had this fabulous uh, fencing uh, that he designed, custom designed, and had this gorgeous uh, gold inlaid medallion and I said, well, let's, uh, let's build one of these things and then put it out on the site just to see how it does in the weather conditions because you got all that salt air from the ocean and wind and humidity and everything. And so they delivered the, uh, the image on the left is the, what they delivered to us. We had it sitting outside of the job site for two months. In two months, it... Uh, the gold disappeared and even the black, the shiny black uh, paint turned gray. So we had to start over with uh, another solution for that. And then um, this was a photo of the roof. And again, these guys, they had been working on this thing for two years and they hadn't put a roof on the building yet. And so they were already putting drywall inside the hotel. And I kept saying, hey, we need a roof, let's, uh, and I just couldn't get uh, any response from them. So it, it just kind of dragged on and on. So, and um, they just kind of threw things wherever they had open space. So our, our site conditions were, um, yeah, you, you basically, you, you don't wanna go to Libya without a tetanus shot, so. Um, and then these, again, these guys, you know, working on the, the um, kind of cleaning up some of their uh, uh, messes that they had on the side of the building. But they, they, you know, one guy had his hard hat on, but the other guy, it could have been a, a fabric covered hard hat. I'm not sure what that was, but, uh, uh, but no, no safety uh, vests or anything. And then this was their version of uh, uh, steel toed shoes. Um, but, uh, it was just, it was hard to believe. So, and these guys are moving to a, a new location with their, uh, scaffolding material to go to the next level, but again, no, no safety harness. <clears throat> and then not even a safety, 
uh, barrier to keep somebody from falling because you know we're up the, in this particular case this this picture is about the fifth floor above grade so um, they didn't put any safety elements in in the uh, project uh, and it definitely was not a lead project so um, we they just kind of collected trash from all over the building and just wherever it fell they just kind of let it stay there until they could figure out how to get it out to, off the site they were using the actually were using the pipe chases uh, uh, as as shoots trash shoots uh, for the project for a long time and um, but you know you know it's it still had a fabulous view of the ocean so uh, it, we uh, you got to kind of take the good with the bad so um, and then about once a month we would have uh, uh, sandstorm. So, you know, it's kind of like fog, but it's a beige fog because the, the storm, the Sahara Desert, basically most of Libya is, is covered in, in sand from the Sahara. So it kind of blows into town and you get these, um, what they would call a, a Ghibli. Uh, so a Ghibli is just a, you know, a bad sandstorm. And um, so I had the opportunity for a four day weekend so I, I found out that I could fly from Benghazi to Cairo uh, for a round trip airfare of $100. So I thought, I called my wife and said, hey, I, I think I'm gonna do that. And so um, I got a chance to, to fly over to Cairo and spend four days over there. And um, so the got to, you know, see the, the typical, the Sphinx, you know, I always thought the Sphinx was huge and it is huge, but compared to the pyramids, it's just, uh, it's just there. And um, so got my little tourist uh, image there. And then right across the street from the uh, Sphinx, you can actually get your uh, Pizza Hut or uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, because they've got it right by the, uh, the main door or main gate to the, uh, the, the pyramid. Then about an hour away from uh, uh, Cairo is a town called uh, Sakhara and they have these uh, the stair step pyramids that uh, were built there. So that was kind of interesting to see that sort of thing. And then about two hours from Benghazi is uh, the town of Cyrene. It's it kind of overlooks the ocean but it was a Greek Greek village uh, town that was built in 600 BC. And um, so I got a chance to check that out. Had the, uh, you know, the, the Greek Doric columns uh, and um, some other structures that they had. When I was there, I think I paid $5 to go into the area and there might've been 25 people total wandering around the space. So you could walk up and, and touch uh, statues and you know nobody was there to keep you from doing it. So it was pretty amazing to see that kind of stuff uh, up close and personal. And um, just the, the, uh, the quality of workmanship and everything. So then right down below Cyrene is a, a little town called Susa and Susa has this little, um, tide pool that uh, is there. And they claim that this is where Cleopatra would kind of stop off at Susa on her way from uh, Egypt to uh, Rome and, uh, you know, get, get freshed up for uh, Mark Antony, I guess. So, um, but the hotel that I stayed at in Benghazi, uh, it was pretty nice. I was up on the top floor and uh, it wasn't very far from the, my hotel project. So it was not a big deal to, to walk uh, over there. Um, but then we had the Day of Rage and you know the, the book that uh, Dr. Jones mentioned, uh, Sketchbook Benghazi kind of talks about um, my experience. And uh, so it was uh, February 17th. Uh, I, I've got it etched in my, my brain. Um, so the protesters, uh, I don't know why they called it Day of Rage. It was kind of a a bad marketing thing, I think, because uh, um, they, uh, you know, they 
it was an anti Qaddafi uh, demonstration. So they pretty much just uh, uh, started shooting up the town. And when I looked out, when I saw the, or heard the shooting at, near my apartment, uh, I looked out my window and saw the police station on fire. So I, I called my boss in Tripoli and said, hey, I, I think I need to get out of here. So um, this is the hotel after the uh, uh, looting and damage from, uh, from the protesters. So my, my room is basically charcoal broiled up there on the upper right-hand corner. So it was a good thing I got out of there when I did. So that, that was about, uh, most of that happened. Uh, by the time I left, this was probably a week or so uh, after I left. So it was still too close for comfort. So, and then uh, downtown Benghazi was just, uh, was a mess. And then they actually got over to the, uh, the hotel and started ripping up uh, a lot of the white marble. Uh, you know, you, you can't see the uh, uh, the balconies anymore. I mean, the the, the horizontal, the, the actual balcony itself, but the railings were were ripped off, and um, so they uh, went a little crazy. So, and then from the same uh, Google Earth map, the um, the, the two job trailers, those blue trailers that were there before, they, they were burned down two days after I left. So they, I evacuated to Malta. And uh, so if you get a chance to go to Malta, it's, it's a little island uh, just north of Tripoli and near Sicily. And it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing place. So it should be on everybody's uh, bucket list. So there's an interesting little town called Imdina where they've got these little narrow streets that you can wander around. And uh, then this was the Church of Mosta. Mosta is uh, right, the, the, the town of Mosta is right in the center of Malta. And the, uh, the architecture inside is just, uh, just amazing. So, and then if you, uh, if you do think about uh, working on projects, uh, international projects, it's always a good idea to study up on some of the cultural things that the country might have, especially some bu special building codes and some special dietary preferences. So one of the uh, dietary preferences is when they, when in Libya, if you ask for American coffee, you're gonna get Nescafe instant. It's not, it's not, yeah, I don't really consider that uh, American coffee. I mean, there's no Starbucks in Libya, so you're kind of out of luck on that. And, uh, <laughs> But they do have every every afternoon. We would actually have um, a break uh, from our meetings and things, and uh, have Turkish coffee. I just wish they would come uh, come up with uh, bigger cups. Uh, it's just too tiny. So then I was then I was an owner's rep, um, and so after the, my Benghazi experience, I was out of work for about six months and I, I got another call from a friend of mine who needed some help in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And uh, I thought, well, should I, you know, should I take, go back to the Middle East? And then I decided, well, anything's gotta be better than Libya. So, so I headed over to uh, the UAE. The, uh, the UAE is actually, you know, United, United Emir Arab Emirates is actually made up of seven Emirates the yellow portion is, is the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, and then Dubai is kind of the brownish colored one. So those are the two largest uh, Emirates. And um, so Dubai, back in the late 60s, early 70s, when, when oil was discovered, um, uh, Sheikh Zayed, uh, well, actually Sheikh Mohammed's father, uh, built these four little towers that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. And that's uh, Sheikh Zayed Road. Uh, that you see right there. And then, if, you know, about uh, 10 or 15 years later, you can still see those four towers are still there and Sheikh Zayed Road starting to get kind of busy. And then uh, this is a view from the Burj Khalifa looking back towards the, and you, you can kind of see those four buildings are still in the center of the, uh, of the screen. Um, so they're keeping those around since they were, uh, got some historical value. And then you've got Sheikh Zayed Road uh, as of today. Uh, this is as you're leaving to go out towards uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. 
And then this was a, a little place that I called home for two years when I lived in Dubai. It's a, uh, a 10 room villa. We had uh, 12 bathrooms. Um, we had about nine, nine of us living there. So it was almost like a fraternity house and we had our own private pool. And um, so it was, it was nice. So, um, but the, one of the projects that I worked on, uh, actually it was in Dubai or Abu Dhabi, I mean, uh, called the gate. And so you have this, uh, this really tall towers about 65 stories. And then the one next to it's called sky tower. Um, and uh, Sun Tower and Sky Tower, and then the four towers with the um, uh, fitness center and conference rooms and restaurants and things are at the top of those four towers. And so uh, the gate area is uh, just outside of Abu Dhabi. And um, this is what it looks like today. They did some value engineering and cut one of the towers out, but uh, it still came out looking pretty nice. And then um, if you get a chance, the uh, Arab or the Emirates Palace Hotel is, uh, is really cool. Uh, great restaurants there. Uh, the rooms, you know, I, I could afford to take my wife there for dinner, but it, we didn't stay in the, in the rooms, a uh, little, little bit too, too pricey for me. But I thought there was something wrong with my digital camera because every time I take a picture, uh, it kind of came out with a yellow tint to it. Well, it turns out it's got so much gold in the room that the way the light was reflecting uh, all my pictures turned out gold. But, uh, and this is one of the rooms that I, I couldn't afford. So I, I at least got a picture of it. So, um, and then there's this, the gorgeous uh, Grand Mosque, which is in Abu Dhabi, was built for Sheikh Zayed, who sort of, he ran the country or, you know, the UAE for about 30 some years. And if you get a chance, uh, this place is amazing and uh, semi-precious stones uh, inlaid into the floor. Uh, it's got a uh, little over 80 domes. Um, it's got uh, the largest hand-woven carpet was made in Turkey for their prayer room. And um, the, uh, just the detailing and the columns and uh, it was just amazing. And um, just the light, the way that lighting has uh, uh, set up. And, and each of these 80 some domes has a different detail inside the dome, which was amazing too, that they came up with all these different ways to uh, decorate the inside of the dome. And um, so it's definitely worth the, the trip to there. Then back in Dubai, you've got the, the Burj Al Arab, which uh, is sort of uh, almost an icon for the, the whole UAE area. It's a 56 story tower, which actually, if you equate that to Indianapolis architecture, the Salesforce Tower, the Chase Tower that's downtown Indianapolis is about 51 stories. And so uh, it's very cool. This is looking up from the lobby up through that uh, lobby space to the top of the, uh, um, the, these rooms are a little pricey too. So I, I didn't, uh, I just got pictures. So, um, uh, and then this is actually another hotel just around the corner from the Burj Al Arab. So it was kind of an interesting backdrop. And then SOM did another tower in Dubai called the, the Kayan Tower and it twists actually 90 degrees as it goes up. I saw this under construction when I was there. It's, it's very cool. And then you've, you've probably seen documentaries on the, uh, the man-made islands that Dubai has. So they actually have three sets of islands. You have the, the palm in the middle, the, uh, I forget now what they call the other uh, set of palms down at the bottom left-hand corner, but not very many people have purchased that, that property. Uh, so then you have these other islands uh, up towards the top of the screen that uh, uh, actually, if you look at it, if you squint your eyes, it actually looks like the world. So you've got uh, North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia. So, uh, and they're, they're kind of renting those, or not renting, they're trying to sell those to uh, somebody who might, 
yeah, again, somebody that's got more money. Uh, but this is the palm. My office was actually at the base of the palm when I was working in Dubai. So that was kind of cool to see the Atlantis, which is very similar to the Atlantis in the Bahamas. And then, uh, then when you're when it's 90 degrees outside and you you know it's uh, and it's Christmas, I took my wife and my daughter to uh, ski Dubai, and um, they were there for Christmas. And um, so it was 90 degrees outside, but it was only 30 degrees inside. And so you just uh, <clears throat> rent your ski paraphernalia and we didn't we don't know how to ski so we just rented the suits and sat around and, and drank hot chocolate uh, in the um, the bar that was made out of uh, ice cubes so um, but they have a and I don't know exactly how you qualify for a uh, black diamond the ski slope but supposedly the ski Dubai has one uh, one black diamond in it so we'll let we'll let other people try that and um, then uh, a project that I worked on in Abu Dhabi, this was a 34-story uh, high-rise apartment building, one and two-bedroom apartments, and um, on the south side of uh, Abu Dhabi. And um, it came out pretty well. It was a pretty, nice, pretty neat project. And um, then, then I, when I moved back to, uh, when I got finished up with all my UAE projects, I, I got the opportunity to work for MGM Resorts in Las Vegas. So uh, Las Vegas is uh, quite an interesting town. So uh, this is just kind of the Bellagio uh, fountain in the Paris area across the street. Um, but one of the projects I worked on was uh, the Alibi Casino Bar. It was actually a renovation of a smaller bar, approximately 3,600 square feet, uh, seating at the bar for about 30 people. The construction cost was about um, $900 per square foot. And so uh, it was nice to have a, you know, almost an unlimited budget. Uh, so that was kind of cool. But I was the design manager. So I was coordinating the drawings from the interior designer that was located in Toronto with the uh, uh, local uh, general contractor. So I was the owner's rep for MGM to make sure that it stayed on, uh, on schedule. And yeah, we were never under budget, so. Uh, so we didn't really worry about that. Just, just sell a few more uh, uh, slot machines. So, and then, uh, then I got a chance to work on the Bardot. It was a, uh, uh, it was a, it's a Michael Mina restaurant and uh, it was a remodel of an existing seafood restaurant. And um, this one, uh, we kind of broke the bank on this one a little bit. We, we it was actually $1,200 a square foot. And um, uh, the, the designer was from Los Angeles and, and, and actually we had the same uh, uh, general contractor on this one, but uh, just the detailing that we had to uh, work on was, uh, was pretty cool. And the tile work and uh, everything that you see, it's kind of, uh, uh, well, not misleading, but uh, all the black uh, was almost, everything had to be almost like a, a baby grand piano. It was an ebony. Uh, finish. Um, and then I uh, actually bumped into a friend of mine in Vegas who, uh, a fellow UC grad, uh, he and I went to school together and um, we worked on uh, the, um, he called me up and said, uh, hey, can you help me with the, the airport? Uh, they, they've asked me to redo their Terminal 1. And so they ripped out all of their two by two uh, carpet tile and put in terrazzo. And so uh, we did, redid the whole floor in, the, in Terminal 1. And we actually ended up uh, winning in 2017. We actually won the National Terrazzo Association Project of the Year uh, by some of the terrazzo designs that we came up with, the custom logo and everything. Uh, so that was interesting to, to uh, get involved with that. But we also redid all the terrazzo Again, it was it was all two by two uh, lay in tile, but uh, we ripped all that out and went with uh, uh, terrazzo, and so the kind of came up with this little color scheme that uh, seemed to work out pretty well. Then I get involved with historic preservation, which actually I'd never 
um, had the opportunity to work on uh, historic projects before. So the uh, Cadet Chapel uh, was a project that AECOM had uh, um, acquired. And uh, <clears throat> it was a two-year project. Uh, the chapel itself is located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And um, uh, that was built in 1962. And this guy named Walter Nash uh, out of Chicago, SOM's office, uh, was the lead designer for the chapel. And he used uh, what he called the field theory, where he would take geometric shapes and put them into a, a repetition. And so he came up with a, a tetrahedron that he uh, used to, uh, he rotated it and kind of flipped it around. So as you can see, each spire um, is really uh, just flipped, almost like an origami kind of thing uh, to create the shape that he wanted. And originally it was, there's six tetrahedrons to each spire. Uh, originally it was gonna be 21 spires, but due to value engineering, they cut it down to uh, 17 spires. And, um, but it's uh, the main sanctuary area is on the, uh, the top floor. Then they have another uh, chapel area and then the basement uh, level area. So technically a, a three-story building but the, the roof itself is the, uh, the aluminum uh, panels that you see in those tetrahedrons. Um, and then, so what you're seeing here is actually uh, three of the tetrahedrons and how they're just kind of ganged together to form the, uh, the shape that uh, they ended up with. Um, and they placed uh, uh, this, this cross member um, and then they're putting in um, the uh, uh, cutting in the uh, the panels themselves. And since it was built in 1962, you kind of see this guy standing on top of uh, of that one panel. Well, that's because OSHA wasn't around in 1962, so they built this thing. It, it's amazing uh, how they actually put this thing together without, uh, well, I, I don't know the whole story as to whether they lost anybody or not, but it, it was tricky to figure out how to get this thing together. And, um, but these fantastic black and white pictures that we found uh, at, the, at the Academy helped us a lot when we were putting uh, our drawings together to figure out how this thing was gonna go together. And, um, but inside, it's just gorgeous. It's all uh, white plaster. Um, and the, it's, I think it's a 4,500 uh, uh, pipe organ, 4,500 pipes in the organ. And um, uh, the, 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 the chapel on the top floor will hold about uh, 1,000 uh, people at a time. It's a stained glass windows. Um, the um, cross was kind of, it's a stainless steel cross just suspended from um, the structure above. And then you've got these, these gorgeous stained glass uh, panels that uh, separate each of the tetrahedrons. And so you've got this scaposis between the, uh, the panels. And it's amazing the way the light comes in. This is actually the Catholic church uh, below the, the, pro, the upper level was the Protestant chapel and then the Catholic uh, church below, which holds about 500. And um, they, we, we found out that some of the artwork that's in the uh, Catholic portion of the chapel was actually quarried from the same quarry that uh, marble pieces were done at the Vatican. They actually uh, put pieces uh, in, in the cadet chapel. And so it kind of gives you a relationship of how the chapel relates to the rest of the campus. It's kind of tucked over to the left there. And um, just different views at different times of the times of the year. And um, it, it's pretty amazing. But then one of the things that we had to deal with as far as uh, analyzing the building is, you know, 9-11 actually, there's a, uh, there's 
uh, the federal government now, if you have a building that's three stories or more, um, they require you to analyze it in case there's what they call progressive collapse. So what we did was we, we did a structural analysis <clears throat> to figure out what would happen if somebody were to place a bomb or some explosive device at one of these buttresses. And we, we discovered after building and doing some analysis that the, the uh, spires would actually drop straight down and we didn't really have to worry about any domino effect uh, of the collapse. So uh, we didn't have to do anything special to meet the, uh, the federal government uh, requirements. Um, and then this is kind of another little quiz for you. Uh, we, we found the drawings uh, for the original, all the shop drawings and everything. And um, one of the, um, one of the cadets uh, found the drawings for us and he said, hey, I found the drawings, but they're on this thing called microfish. And so somebody said, well, I don't, what is that? You know, so we, 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 finally, we found somebody in Denver that actually converted all of our microfish drawings to um, uh, PDF files. So we were able to actually uh, work from some of the original um, SOM drawings and um, just kind of, uh, these are just some of the hand drawings that uh, we were dealing with, the main floor. The, the circular uh, sanctuary is actually the, the Jewish temple that's within the building. So that was interesting stuff. Um, and just the, the hand lettering, the dimensioning, it was just almost uh, artwork in, it, in and of itself. They did some of the details at full scale. Um, so you could see all the detail work in the uh, building itself. And um, they on the doors, the, the main doors, you can't quite see it in this picture, but they actually have uh, pop rivets that were smoothed down just like an airplane um, rivet in the door panel. So. And then we got into what, you know, you can, if you, if architectures, you, you can actually get into another uh, field of architecture called forensic architecture, where because the, or the reason why the Pentagon called uh, AECOM or selected AECOM is we put together a team to analyze why is the building leaking? It's leaked every year since it was built in 1962. And so we discovered that they, uh, uh, we put sensors on on the roof and the, all over the building, and we found out that uh, the wind pressure um, actually caused well even the heat buildup because the way the building's oriented north and south, the sun coming up on the east, uh, parts of the panels were heating up to 120 degrees, while the panel next to it's in shade, and it was down to like 90 degrees, so it was expanding at different rates. And so it was popping all the seams and they were caulking the, um, the building every year. And somebody calculated that they put 32 miles of caulk on the building every single year. So they got tired of doing that. So they said, somebody has got to figure out how to fix this thing. So they called uh, AECOM and AECOM teamed up with a company out of Chicago called uh, Wish Janney Elsner. And, that, and that's kind of like all they do is uh, analyze this stuff. And uh, we figured out how to uh, uh, basically build a rain screen um, of, uh, under the building. And, and because the building is on the Nat National Historic Registry, uh, we couldn't really change the look and feel of it too much. So uh, the new design, uh, it's, it's going to take about three years to take the thing apart and put it back together. But uh, um, part of that is because we, we also uh, did some uh, study where we put uh, uh, wind pressure or uh, wind gauges around the building and found out that out of 365 days, uh, 220 days a year, the wind was more than 25 miles an hour. And so OSHA you know, gets involved with the project again. They don't really like the crane operators to be in a crane, elevated crane, if the wind's more than 25 miles an hour. So what we ended up doing, the project, they're actually going to build 
and they're in the process right now of building a structure around the chapel and have it enclosed so that they can work 24 uh, seven on the building and not have to have, they're actually gonna have a, a, a gang, a gangway uh, inside to lift the panels and move them around. So um, they, they don't have to worry about kind of, that kind of stuff. So uh, then it, uh, my career took a new path that I, I still pinch myself that when I think about it, but I had, I had to spend four months in the Bahamas and four months in the US Virgin Islands. And so this project, the first one in the Bahamas was actually, it's a, a new resort casino called Bahamar. And uh, so it's actually got 2000 rooms, about six swimming pool areas. Um, so I had to force myself to, uh, to, to go to the Bahamas and, and hang out for four months. But I, I ended up being forced to stay at a all inclusive uh, resort hotel next door. So I could walk to work. I didn't have to worry about uh, driving to work. So it was, it was tough, uh, tough duty. And, um, so it was, it was a fun project to, uh, to deal with for four months. And, and these were the typical rooms, um, in the hotel. And, um, what was kind of interesting about this project is the, all the bathrooms, these super duper, uh, pretty nice uh, bathroom areas were actually prefab units that were made off site and shipped in. And then they dropped them in place inside the, uh, the hotel and then match the, the tile on the floor. Um, and then uh, a few times I actually got to hang out at the grotto um, and uh, you know, pick up some uh, vitamin D. And uh, you can actually go into this one grotto and those two rectangular windows that you see there are uh, two inch thick glass panels um, where you can sit on that ledge and uh, sharks will actually come up to the window so you can just sort of sit there and drink your Mai Tai and and uh, hang out with the sharks. Um, and then uh, after the island experience in Nassau, then I uh, got sent over to St. Thomas and St. John to evaluate the hurricane damage from Ir Irma and Maria. And uh, these two hurricanes actually hit the island, uh, both of them, one at the beginning of October and this was back uh, 2017, I think. Um, but one, one hit the island at the beginning of October and the other one hit the, at near the end of October. So uh, the devastation was just uh, amazing. And so our work schedule was uh, nine hours a day, six days a week, going around evaluating all these homes that were destroyed and schools and hospital and, and that sort of thing. And uh, but uh, uh, I felt truly blessed and privileged to stay at the Margaritaville uh, Resort uh, while I was there in St. Thomas. So my one day off uh, during the week, I got to hang out at the infinity pool uh, overlooking the bay. So it, you know, good with the bad. So, um, and then, then you've got gorgeous views of uh, St. John uh, that you have to deal with. So, and then uh, after done with the islands, the uh, uh, AECOM sent me up to uh, uh, Chicago and uh, I was introduced to, by the general contractor as the cleaner. And I was a little confused by uh, that title until I found out that the contractor wanted me to clean up the mess that uh, the previous architect had done on the project. So uh, if you're familiar with the Pulp Fiction and Harvey Keitel's uh, portion of the movie, uh, you, you'll kind of know what the, the cleaner means. And, um, but this project was uh, to coordinate actually the, the rental car tenant construction projects within the facility. And they, uh, the building itself, the, the parking garage was pretty much done, but it's a five story parking garage and uh, each floor of the parking garage is approximately 11 acres. So it was, uh, it was huge. And, uh, uh, but the, the glass box that was built on the front of the uh, parking garage is where all of the uh, rental car companies had their facilities. And then they also had a 
train that would bring you in from the airport uh, to pick up your rental car. Um, and then it, it was, again, the, the glass box was actually pretty huge too. And um, we, I got a chance to uh, participate in the selection of artwork for the, uh, the building. So this blue structure that you see uh, are these little fins that are uh, bolted to the wall to make it look like um, uh, almost like the, it's, it's not a kinetic uh, structure though. So they're fixed in place, but they wanted it to look like clouds uh, inside the space. So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, and then if we're talking about things, the last, this last section that deals with things or facets of design profession that uh, you might want to consider if, if, uh, if architecture or interior design doesn't uh, fit your purpose. But uh, these are some little things that I got involved with over the years. Uh, I would suggest that if you get a chance to get involved with local charity groups, you can, uh, a lot of times they'll have a design competition. So this was a birdhouse that I actually designed for a wood duck and um, they actually paid uh, you know, somebody, it was an auction. And so uh, it got $200 for it. So uh, that was kind of interesting. And um, set design is also something that you might consider um, as uh, another design career option. And so uh, my brother and I were asked by our church to put together a spaceship for their vacation Bible school. So we got a little carried away. Um, and it was about 22 feet tall and uh, a sheet metal. And uh, we had it set up so that the kids could actually go inside the spaceship and uh, you know, put their face uh, through that little porthole, get their picture taken. And um, I even had a smoke, uh, smoke making machine built into it. So I had uh, smoke coming out of the side of it um, just to add a little uh, flavor to it. And then um, our church, we, 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 we go to a pretty, pretty good sized church, but uh, they wanted us to uh, design and build a life size uh, village of Bethlehem inside of our gymnasium. So this wall that you see where the arched doorways are, that's all actually a styrofoam wall um, that, we, uh, that we built. Um, and uh, we, we cut the stones ourselves with a hot knife and painted it to make it look like, uh, uh, you know, so solid stone. This was just uh, inside the gymnasium uh, parts of the village. And um, then we did a, uh, a two-story um, temple inside the, the main sanctuary where they were going to have the Last Supper uh, in that, on the temple. And then then our, uh, our music director at the church actually thought it would be interesting to have a light show that synchronized to music. So we came up with a wall of lights. It was 12 feet high, 60 feet long. And we had about 8,000 Christmas lights all hooked up to a computer to synchronize the, uh, the lights with the music. And so different scenes would, would come up uh, on the screen at different times during the program. And... Um, that took some doing. Um, then uh, our, you know, the whole set design portfolio expanded when, when somebody asked us to do a, a set design for Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And so we did the, uh, the backdrop uh, areas and um, we actually built uh, eight three foot by three foot by three foot uh, triangular shaped pieces, uh, columns basically and each face of the, of the column was, uh, one was painted with the desert scene. Uh, the next one had uh, um, uh, Potiphar's uh, temple. And then the last one was painted black for the, uh, for the jail scene. And you could just rotate the columns. And uh, we found some wallpaper that actually looked pretty cool in 3D. And uh, so we built our own pyramid and we had our own King Tut uh, uh, display. Um, so that was a fun project. And then we did another set design for the musical 1776 um, that worked out pretty well. Just, it's amazing what you can get wallpaper to look like brick. So, um, 
And then I got into uh, furniture design. This was uh, um, my attempt at, uh, I kind of like Charles Rene McIntosh, uh, some of the work uh, pieces that he's done. Uh, he has a chair called the tea room chair. And so this was a piece of furniture that a friend of mine uh, helped build for me. And uh, then I've got, um, I did this uh, coffee table that actually you pull the sections of the coffee table out uh, 90 degrees to each other and it kind of expands the uh, coffee table into almost like a pinwheel. And then you can change the surface on the inside to you know, a different material if you want. So there's no set um, pattern to it. And it, as, as Dr. Jones mentioned, I, I did an iPhone uh, app. When I, when I got laid off in 2009, uh, you know, I was waiting for that job to, to show up with Libya. And so I put together a, uh, a user interface for this uh, wallpaper uh, paint calculator. And a friend of mine, uh, he wrote the code for it. And I, I designed the, uh, the user interface itself. So we sold the app for $1.99. And so when I was in Benghazi, my wife called me and said, hey, we got our first check, our royalty check from Apple. And I said, well, go ahead and open it. We'll see how much we made. And she said, wow, it's $43. And uh, so I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to stay in Benghazi a little longer. Uh, so it was fun to just to, to try it and see what would happen. And um, then in April of uh, 2017, I, uh, I wrote my book called Spe Sketchbook Benghazi. It's, uh, it's listed in Amazon. Um, and uh, I think we've got about, uh, I've sold about 200 of them. So it's, uh, you know, it was fun to try it and see what would happen. So um, then uh, if you're a YouTuber, uh, I've got a, uh, you could subscribe to my YouTube site called Architect 52. And uh, so I produced a video of uh, IM Pei's uh, art museum in Doha. And um, it's about a, about a, you know, three and three, three minutes and 46 seconds long. It's not very long, but uh, we, I've got over 15,000 views on it. So to me, as an architect, that to me is, I would consider that viral. So um, I, I don't know what I'm up to yet, but uh, uh, at least, at least I hit 15,000. So, and then uh, <clears throat> uh, my wife claims that I told her that if, if I ever retire, that I was going to take up oil painting. And uh, I did a couple of uh, watercolor paintings in college, but I didn't really mess with oils too much. But uh, so last year I got out some oil paints and she, she bought me a starter kit. And um, so I started working on some uh, oil paints, uh, oil paintings of my own. So I call this one uh, Mum's the Word. And um, then I took the, the grandkids to Yosemite uh, not too long ago and took some photographs of Yosemite and painted this of uh, the upper and lower falls. And then um, I've been experimenting with the uh, palette knife. And uh, this is a view of the Sedona. If you ever get a chance to go to Sedona, it's an amazing place. Uh, that's a cathedral rock, I think they call it. But, um, and then uh, the cliff dwellers took the kids out to Arizona and saw that uh, too. So I was kind of experimenting with palette knife and uh, uh, brush techniques on, on that one. Um, and then uh, this one, I was just kind of experimenting with a black canvas and just to get some interesting things going on with the midnight ocean scene. So, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Elliott group is a group of one, but uh, I'm, I'm keeping pretty busy with the different things at Ball State. So, uh, Maybe someday it'll be a larger firm than just one, but but who knows? Uh, you, you never know in this world. So, um, and then uh, as far as a new career path, uh, you know, appreciate uh, uh, the new career path that Ball State's given me, and uh, I'm having fun sharing my experiences and ideas with my students, and uh, uh, it's it sort of worked out. Uh, and uh, the uh, the one thing that threw out my, I don't know if it would be considered my mantra or not, but uh, the, the, the poem by Robert Frost, uh, where he says, uh, 
Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that's made all the difference. So it's kind of my uh, way of closing out uh, um, our session today. I hope uh, everybody had fun. And um, um, if you've got any questions, I guess we'll, uh, we'll check them out and see what happens. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Tony. Now, if uh, anyone wants to go ahead and type any comments or questions for Tony, uh, we will take a, um, a few minutes and see if, um, if we do get any questions. Tony, um, at the beginning, you did mention that uh, you're registered uh, in a couple states and in a couple disciplines. Uh, do you have any advice for some young designers who are about to graduate uh, who are considering whether it's worthwhile or not? Um, yeah, I guess uh, it, it's, it's hard work. I mean, I, when I took the exam, things, things are a little different now, but when I took the exam, uh, there were four written parts and, and one drawing part. Uh, the written part was uh, two days, uh, two eight hour days, and there were four, you know, a number two pencil and that kind of thing. And so um, I, uh, it, it was tough. You know, I, I, um, but um, in the old days, you had to, if you missed one of the parts, you had to get a 75 or better on each part. And uh, I, I forget now what part it was, but I got a 72. And so I, I, I passed the other three, but um, I had to take all four parts over again. I didn't, I didn't just have to take the one part. And um, so that kind of set me back. I was kind of depressed a little bit, but uh, uh, I got, got busy and took it again because it was only offered once a year. Um, so yeah, finally, finally got it in 79. Um, the, the test in Nevada was uh, a lot easier to take. So um, the, I, yeah, it, I think being registered will get you into a few more doors. Um, and uh, um, well, especially, you know, being registered helped me get uh, my position at uh, Ball State. So, uh, so that's kind of nice. And um, but yeah, I think it, it's uh, it's worth it. Um, uh, you know, I you know I I I do it again. Uh, it's uh, I, I don't know how the new tests work because it's all computer computer graded, but. Uh, um, uh, and the tricky thing about, uh, uh, I wouldn't go crazy and try to get uh, uh, 50 state licenses because it's either going to cost you or your company a lot of money to pay the, uh, the registration fees uh, each year. So uh, I wouldn't go too wild and crazy with it. So Wonderful. Um, I'm just looking at some of the comments on uh, Everybody uh, congratulating you on doing a great job and, and how interesting some of your projects and your, your career have been. Um, you did uh, you mention that you were at a number of firms and um, you know, I guess that the idea of setting uh, at a single firm for 35 years or something, uh, was that something that you had initially wanted or uh, it, it just wound up happening? Yeah, I mean, the, the firm that I was with, I mean, I started out uh, back in the 70s with uh, Lennox Matthews, Simmons and Ford. Uh, they were a huge firm back in the, the early days. And so they did, they did the city county building, they did uh, quite a few schools. And, and I thought, uh, yeah, this would, this would be a nice place to stay for 35 years. But, uh, you know, again, the economy, um, some of the partners decided to start their own firms. Uh, so they kind of split off and, and the economy got kind of crazy. And, and so, uh, um, I mean, we went from uh, probably 50 or 60 people down to six. Wow. And, and so, uh, so I saw the writing in the wall. And so, um, and, and Lennox Matthews actually got bought out by a, another firm later on. But uh, so I went to CSO Architects and, um, just over the years, uh, actually, I've, I've worked with CSO three times, so uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's it, the Indianapolis market is uh, 
um, you know, everybody knows everybody. So, uh, and that's one thing that I think students, uh, when you get out of school or even while you're in school, uh, networking is the name of the game. Um, I mean, the two or three of my jobs that I've gotten, the MGM job and um, uh, actually the AECOM job were all based on the fact that I uh, was a member of the AIA and I, uh, I was on the, uh, the board uh, as a liaison for the interiors group. And so I, I think I got a chance to, you know, have more opportunities because of my AIA um, involvement. Wonderful. And you mentioned how many, um, you know, how many programs you would use. And by the way, in all honesty, I took uh, Fortran my uh, first year as well. So right. Four, Fortran four. Uh, no, not four. Uh, right. We didn't use the cards anymore. Before, oh, okay. okay. But they were still around in the. Uh, in the room still. So we oh, used okay. scrap paper. Okay. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it seems a little overwhelming for a student to have to learn, uh, you know, AutoCAD and Revit and SketchUp and all these things. Um, do you have any advice as far as, uh, you know, keeping current and, uh, and adapting to the new technology? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I, I, I was introduced um, to CAD in 1980, uh, there was a, a system back in those days called CalComp. And, um, and then I uh, just kind of fell into this uh, fantastic program called uh, GDS or BDS and GDS was actually uh, um, being provided, uh, supported by McDonnell Douglas. And so again, a huge company, um, <clears throat> but it was, we actually, in 1982, we were actually doing 3D modeling with uh, real-time interference checking that some CAD systems still can't do. So it was a pretty amazing program and it just kind of, it was rather expensive. Um, but you know, in those days, everything was. Um, but I, I love CAD and, but sometimes CAD, um, I think, um, not cheats it. Uh, um, the students still need to know how to put a set of drawings together. I mean, the, again, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you can really screw up a drawing um, on CAD a lot quicker, um, and you have to go back and fix that. But uh, I think Revit, Revit's a, a pretty terrific program. It's, it's again, it's getting expensive the way they keep pricing things. So. Uh, I don't know who's out there that's coming up with something that's going to, you know, uh, beat the marketplace for Revit. But, uh, I, you know, it's definitely something you should learn because most firms are going to want to see some kind of Revit experience uh, to get a, a decent job. Wonderful. We do have a, uh, a, a comment uh, question uh, from Mr. Franklin. How is it that you were teaching here at Ball State, but enjoying that tropical breeze in the background? <laughs> well, I'm tired of uh, this uh, gloomy weather, so I have to figure out how to get uh, a, a decent virtual background uh, uh, on my screen. So at least I feel like I'm uh, uh, tropical. And, and my wife, uh, so when I, um, you know, different projects were coming up or potential projects for me, uh, she said that, well, just check, check the scope of work before you accept anything. And if, if it has the word beach or island somewhere in the job description, then you can go ahead and sign up for that. But uh, uh, I'm, I think there's, there's not really a beach at, on Ball State campus, but there, there is that uh, pretty nice little uh, pond up on the north end. So, <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, that's probably an understatement that there is no beach here at Ball State. Yes. Right. Uh, well, Tony, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your wonderful career and thank you for being at Ball State, uh, both today and in our classes. Um, I will say that uh, it's wonderful having you as a member of the faculty team and it's, uh, it's been wonderful hearing a little bit more about your wonderful career. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.